Welcome, it's Jeremy Allen Gould. I'm coming to you today to confirm between God and of man that in fact the rumors that you have all heard are true. I started this podcast because I freaking love music. I was privileged enough to book amazing artists and bands in the past, and I was lucky enough to stay in touch with many of them to this day. This is a place to hear their stories. Thank you so much for riding along on this journey, and I hope you enjoy what you hear. With that said, the rumors are definitely true. Hey guys, welcome back to this latest episode. My name is Jeremy, and today I welcome the almighty Kevin Robinson. You know Kevin from the bands Viva Voce, Francis, Electric Ill, Blue Giant, and a million other bands. Uh, Awesome conversation, so cool to get to know Kevin. Uh, We've been talking lately, and it's just been an awesome connection. Uh, Super stoked on this episode. Um, Kevin's done some incredible things in his career um we talk about uh a lot of the old viva voce records as well as again blue giant and electric ill records and the solo records and his time on snl with the shins what an awesome conversation hope you enjoy it kevin robinson kevin thank you so 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 much for coming on my podcast i really really appreciate it Jeremy, thanks for having me. Man, what an awesome opportunity. I'm so stoked. Uh, you know, I just have been a fan for quite a while, and I think this is a cool opportunity. And, again, I just want to thank you. And tell me what you're up uh, What you're up to now. What, what's going on in your life, man? I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Um, I am living in Muscle Shoals, Alabama right now, which is – a little bit of a trip um, because this is where everything started for me um, back in, I want to say like 96 or 7 is when uh, Viva Voce got signed for the first time. And I was living here when that happened. And so 27 years later, I'm back in the same town and bizarrely, a lot of the same families and people that came to my shows are living back here now so it's become like a a boomerang of returning to the place of origin um i uh, my wife sarah and i had a baby last year ruby just turned one um so a lot of new beginnings um i i came back here in 2018 Um, to kind of take care of my mom um, in her final days and, you know, wound up riding out the pandemic here and going through all that. I ran for mayor of Sheffield. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so cool. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's a whole other podcast. Uh, (laughs) But, um, yeah, this is where I'm at now. And, um it's it's been really a good return to roots for me because all of the people that were in my life creatively at that time have come full circle round um my first band nine volt velvet uh we all got back together in 2019 and basically just picked up where we left off and you know wrote songs like we'd never been apart it was pretty amazing and we've kept in touch since then and um, yeah, uh, I've moved around a lot. Uh, I've from here to Nashville, from Nashville to Portland, from Portland to New York city, and now back here. Um, but this is where I am for now. <laughs> that's so cool. What a homecoming. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Life, life is, life is pretty cool. You can't really make this stuff up. 
Yeah, absolutely. The prodigal son returns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, um, let's talk about some of the influences, some of the bands, some of the records that you kind of gravitated to um, growing up, man, for, um, you know, kind of what was it like for you growing up and how was music implemented? And let's talk yeah. about that for a little bit. Um, well, music, um, you know, my, my brother and I had a band when we were kids, um, but no one was really brave enough to sing. Like whoever got up in front of the microphone was just mocked relentlessly. So, you know, no one really had it in them to sing. I played drums, he played guitar. Um, but there was like a bifurcation early on. He was into Aerosmith and hair metal, and I was into like the cure and the church and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, it, it languished a little bit in my teen years uh, until I had a, um, a hiking accident that, you know, there was a good few years of recovery for me. And I purchased a cassette four track during that recovery time and taught myself how to record and learned enough about each instrument, guitar and piano and bass, just to be able to manufacture the songs that I had going in my head. And that was kind of like a really good uh, education for me of like how songs work, you know, uh, and discovered it very genuinely and innocently of like, oops, loaded the cassette tape in wrong and figured out how backwards reverb worked and that mm. sort of. Um, so, uh, and in that time frame, you know, grew up in youth, youth group culture in the South, like most, yeah. you know, most people do, which means that there's like the, the music that sold at the Baptist bookstore was kind of what there was to choose from aside right. from was played on like, you know, Y107, you know, Hits FM, which at that time was pretty deplorable. You know, Black Flag never came through Northern Alabama. Yeah. Uh, they did. I didn't know about it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I discovered most things retroactively, like, you know, Starflyer 59 was a huge eye oh, yeah. Then retroactively going back and discovering like, oh, my bloody Valentine and, you yep. know, Sonic Youth. And then after discovering Sonic Youth, realizing like the, the Stooges and the Velvet Underground just keep going back. So a lot of times my music education began within the Christian music uh, dichotomy. Yeah. Um, before learning about the bands that influenced them in the first place. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, Mark Cross uh, and I met in 1993 or four, I forget. And we started uh, an acoustic duo called The Threshing Floor. And it was uh, him on guitar and me on mandolin. And we did really weird stuff like play Bulgarian women's choir and just drone. <laughs> and so we, we did that for a while. And then slowly but surely like nirvana and pumpkins hit and it was mm. like the change was happening and we wanted to rock out but we were playing this you know i don't know medieval stuff and and so you know got electric guitars went and bought the big muffs the 90s big muffs yeah. came out and learned how feedback was wonderful and, and started nine volt velvet with, uh, Donnie's Donnie, who was a drummer in Mark's band. And we started nine volt velvet. And that was, that was big, uh, for me because it was like the camaraderie of a sports team, uh, on stage. Like it was That's so cool. The, yeah. The point was just to decimate the stage, just to wreck it like physically wreck it and then mm -hmm. also make every band playing with us wish they weren't going to be playing. <laughs> so, it was a mission, even though we were good little Christian kids, we were, we just wanted to absolutely destroy the stage and being in Alabama at that time, you know, the, the choices of places to play were slim. Yeah. So we would rent out, you know, the theater next to Chuck E. Cheese, you know, which was, probably built for children's puppet shows and stuff like that. <laughs> so as the 
chain was failing, they would rent these theaters out to local people to do concerts. And Nine Volt Velvet played our first concert in a Chuck E. Cheese theater. And I remember wearing silver spandex and like fake <laughs> it. So we were brave in the sense that, you know, I don't see kids doing that now. Um, but I'm sure we, we kind of looked and sound freakish at the time. But it was really a wonderful and a creative time for me that I'm very fortunate to have, you know, experienced. Um, but that was the genesis of everything, pretty much. Well, what were what were the influences for Nine Volt at the time? Like, what were you? I know you obviously mentioned some of the bands, but what yeah. were what were you guys like? What was the sound you were going for? Oh, like, I mean, it was a it, we became like a feedback loop because then all of us went into our little cubby holes and would come back and be like, check out this pavement record, check out, you know, the early Sonic Youth stuff, check this out. We were all independently digging and bringing all those different, yeah. um, you know, influences in for better and for worse. And Mark and I would take trips to Chattanooga hours in the car just to go buy guitar pedals from this guy in Chattanooga named Bill Barr. Uh -huh. And so we were relentlessly hunting for sounds, anything that was just left of ordinary, like when uh, Diamond C, Sonic Youth, uh, Washing Machine came yeah. out, the hunt for whatever that sound was came on. Um, it was just basically the influence was like how we could kind of just trip one another out because there was the, the high water mark of the wall of distortion was discovered. So yep. we knew that when the chorus came in, it was time to punch you in the face. <laughs> but then everything else was just sort of a, a sonic exploration of, of like song styling and, yeah. and then really snobby gear purchases. <laughs> yeah. So, I get it. You, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it took a hot minute yeah, I, Mark let me borrow his first guitar, which was a Hondo, and then realized that all the shows I was going to, you know, Jason Martin was playing like a Les Paul recorder. And so you really, in the early stages of making music, you really just think if I have this fancy stuff, it'll make me sound better. Yeah. You know? But I look back at all the pictures of me back in those days, and I had incredibly expensive stuff that was like years beyond my ability to play but yeah I, you know i worked my job for that specific reason just to <laughs> just to have badass gear <laughs> totally 100 percent. whether i can play it or not yeah well that's half half of it is looking cool you know it's uh... I, I would say for me it was like a good 75 to 80 <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that's so cool um, did you guys, uh, when you guys were playing, did you, obviously you got to play with some, some of the bands you were looking up to, I assume. Um, did you get to play with anyone that you can remember and, uh, was there any labels interested or was it just kind of, you know? So, you know, the early days, all my heroes were like Prayer Chain, uh, Violet Burning, Starflyer 59, those bands. And yeah. Got to play with, um, if I remember right, we we got to open for Prayer Chain and Starflyer. Um, it was really great. It was it felt like uh, being part of a scene, for better or for worse, you yeah. know. And I don't take that for granted because it's really rare. Um, years later, got to meet all of them, you yeah, know, and become peers with them, and so even. Cool you know, stay at some of their homes and that sort of thing. Um, and now, it, after all these years, have reconnected and still am in touch with some of those guys. Um, Love that. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, everyone kind of has to make peace with that time in their life in some form or fashion because the creative element was always easy to kind of justify because everyone really wanted to kind of do the same thing, yeah. which match and, and exceed their their expectations of what their heroes were doing mm -hmm. but a lot of times it got completely pigeonholed and cornered into this uh religious you know camp that really disintegrated a lot of the artistic merit of some yeah. incredible art you know mm -hmm. 
Absolutely, I agree with that. So that's cool, man. Um, how long after Nine Volt did Viva Voce begin? Is that kind of how it materialized? Um, you know. So Nine Volt had like, you know, if you play music in Northwest Alabama, you're gonna play with practically every other band that's similar to you in some form or fashion. And um, Anita had a band with Cam, who was in a band with Donnie and Mark and Cam. The three of them were in a band called Elysian Fields. Cam started a band called uh, Just Human, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. Donnie and Mark started Nine Volt. So Just Human and Nine Volt Velvet played a bunch of shows in Alabama. And Anita was the guitar player in Just Human. And uh, strangely enough, uh, this guy, uh, Craig Johnson, was the bass player in Just Human. And Craig is now the set designer for Stranger Things. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, he's got a band called Space Knife. He's gone on to do amazing stuff. But um, yeah, so Anita and I first met when our bands were playing. I think Just Human opened for Nine Volt at that Chuck E. Cheese show. And that, <laughs> That's awesome. How we met and uh, started playing songs together. And um, at first, we were called Nectarine. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, just four tracking, you know, just yeah. songs that didn't fit either band, just kind of four tracking. And um, I remember, like, Rocket Town in Nashville was like yeah. a... a a great place for us to travel to and would usually get like a caravan of cars and would go up and see shows when they would play there. Um, there was a guy named Greg Strange, I want to say, um, did like a proper demo of Nectarine well, like that was a little bit better than, you know, cassette four track sure. stuff. And those, um, those demos wound up getting us a record label offer. Okay. From Cadence. From Cadence, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, I was really curious. So um, I remember that label, and I, I don't remember meaning much of it, but I just – how how did that kind of material like, – I keep saying materialize, but how did that how did that come in to the picture? Um, I, you know, I'm not really sure how the demos made their way to them other than Greg was probably connected at some point. But um, the label president was this guy named Stephen Clifford, who was the vocalist for an 80s metal band called Icon. Okay. And, like, literally, you know, spandex pants, you know, hairspray, yeah. metal, metal, metal. And I think he heard it. It was, like, wall of guitars, uh, you know, girl vocalist. There was, like, a marketability there that they saw. Um, and... I, I hope genuinely resonated with the songs and um, reached out to sign the band. And it was a comical thing of, you know, getting a contract in the mail that's like, you know, a phone book size <laughs> build contract. And then opening the phone book to L lawyer and calling some guy up to look, look it over. Yeah. And, and Muscle Shoals, mind you, you know. Yeah. And him just being like, oh, it's a nine album deal. Like, oh. great, 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 kid. All you got to do is make hits for the next 20. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but that's that's kind of how, like, N Nectarine was technically signed to Cadence based off the demos that Greg recorded with us. And we had to change the name because there was another Nectarine somewhere or something like that. And I had a book of album titles and song titles and just things I thought were cool. And Viva Voce was one that I had nice. starred as, I think we were going to call the album that or something. Um, so we just decided to change it. That's cool. Yeah. So you signed to Cadence um, and you start working on Hooray for Now, essentially. Yeah. So let's yeah. talk about that record, a fantastic record. Thanks. Definitely should have been, in my opinion, um, I don't know. I just think it's one of those records that like should have been bigger than it was. I really truly feel that. Um, yeah. So let's talk about that record. Well, thank you. I mean, I we we did our best, and I think that a lot of the stuff that was put out on that label didn't really get a much life. You know, the label didn't yeah. live long. Um, but 
it was it was like our opportunity to to go for it and actually record something in a real big boy studio with the window and the console and to yeah. take um so at the time i was extremely intimidated by everything nashville because it's pretty much a machine and new a producer that worked with third day and rocket boy and so there was oh, yeah. I, it was just made purely off of uh comfort rather than ability yeah one person that the label wanted us to work with was roy thomas baker who did like queen and wow. Bohemian rhapsody yeah they wanted him to produce it and i remember thinking you know we were listening to butch big produced pumpkins records yeah. and I, I don't want this to sound like queen you know yeah um so we went with dave martis and it was a bit of like an arm wrestle right out of the gate because he was very much like a a hendrix you know the sound of a cab and a guitar is it and we were walked in with like you know backpacks full of pedals <laughs> um and and also used to uh and at that point i was like 20 two and i'd been recording since i was 15 so it was very much used to like the click track the scratch the drums the bass like doing it all ourselves mm. and got in there and it was pretty much like a sit down shut up we're going to tell you how it's done kind of thing so um i remember there it was it was uh a a chore. I remember we left in tears a good bit making that record and even had to threaten the record label at the end that if we didn't get a chance to remix it, we were going to just break up. Mm. <laughs> or like literally, oh, yeah. we threatened our own death before that album ever saw the light of day. Wow. Of the way, yeah. The, the, the engineer, his name is Mark Chevalier. We owe, owe him that album. If you like the way it sounds, it's Mark yeah. Chevalier's work. Um, he was a fantastic guy, like the saving grace of that record. Wow. And um, yeah, just a wonderful human being, as well as like impeccable art and skill. Um, so, you know, we, it was exciting in the sense that. You know, you're you're recording in the White House studio in Music Row, which is where they prattled off a bunch of bands that are recorded in there. But the only one that stuck with me was um, Eddie Rabbit. I love Rainy Night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. I, we'll, we can do this. Um, but it, it felt it felt like a, a you know a very much like a VH1 behind the music. Learn all wow. your heavy lessons, making it. Like, if I had a tone and idea, I was going to have to fight for it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it wasn't all, uh, you know, there were moments of, like, Wade James, who was a hero of mine, played bass on the entire album. Wow. Um, who, you know, from Chagall Guevara. Yeah. Fame, uh, in phenomenal bass player. And I got, um, we got to have Matt from Sixpence play cello. And That's so cool. Yeah, um, we wound up mixing it at Russ Long. He had a place called Carport, which I think was like a overdub studio in his backyard, and uh, did all the like weird stuff there. Like, there's a, a walkie-talkie vocal on "Fear of Flying" and mm -hmm. all that stuff. The weird experimental stuff. Yeah, that we couldn't get away with at the fancy studio we did there. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that is so rad. Yeah. Um, when the record was done, and you, you know, obviously you said it was like a learning lesson type type of record for you. How did how, what was it validating? How did it feel? I mean, I think it sounds fantastic. It was, you know, it took it took a while before I could listen to it with a sense of accomplishment because yeah. for the longest time, even down to the artwork, all I could really see was like. And I think most artists probably go through this is like all, all they hear is the mistakes and what they wished could have yeah. happened. You no, know, I gave, I was, I, and still am a huge fan of Blue Note uh, jazz artwork mm -hmm. and just kind of mocked something up on like, uh, I think it was like Corel Draw or Microsoft Paint or something and gave the art gal at the label this thing that I had mocked up 
with like little triangles on it. I was like, Hey, just something real simplistic blue note like this. And when she gave the art to the label, it was literally the, the Microsoft paint JPEG that I had Oh seen. my God. So like the cover for that album was something that I just did in like five seconds at home that she just kind of prettied up like that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, we were real big fans of like that early tooth and nail. Yeah. Like they had an impeccable first run of, of absolutely like driver eight Joe Christmas. There were so many great albums like that first Morales for like all the Morales for yeah. stuff. It was just like the high watermark kept getting pushed higher and higher and higher. And we wanted to match that, you know, um, but it was very much a Nashville based thing that I was not the Pacific Northwest at all, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it wasn't until we got out and were able to kind of tour it and play it that it felt like we were among our peers in that yeah. group. And even before the label went defunct, had already booked time with Avast. Oh yeah. 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 And, and John Goodmanson to produce the second one and we were about a week away. We were somewhere in California, and we this was pre cell phone. Got a text from the um, secretary. It was nine one one. You know, call me. And the label had been liquidated while we were out on tour. Like literally, people showed up with screw guns and uh, dismounted the TVs from the walls. Unbelievable. So she's like, "There is no more record label." And so we had to call the studio, and you know, with our hat in our hand, and they were super cool about it, but. Drove home on our merch money and licked our wounds and figured out what was going to happen next. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Tooth and Nail. Um, why just what, did they come after you? Was there ever any talks with that label at all? or Not really. And I think if we'd maybe been smarter back then, we could have approached them for it. But it just felt like uh, it was a club we weren't in because we didn't know any of them. Sure. This kind of Nashville was over here and Seattle was way up yeah. there. Um, there slowly became like a pipeline, I think partly because of our own doing that, you know, Matt and the Havelina guys would crash on our couch and Jesse Sprinkle and all these bands yeah. through Serene UK. It would just like even Tillman back in the day, like the first time we met, he was just crashing on my sofa playing with those dudes. Um so there wasn't like this connective tissue between those two realms yeah at that time i get it i think you would have been perfect on it personally yeah i no. i agree i would have loved to but they, they they shifted really quickly as well like they went away from yeah as, as a brand they went away from this eclectic art all over the place yeah 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 like more of like a hardcore hot topic kind of thing yeah yeah, uh, that was the, that. What was what, what was selling at For the sure. time? But I also that's what I loved about Tooth and Nail in the rig, in the beginning was the, the yeah. expansive musical totally. taste. I, that's totally. what I loved about it. Absolutely. Um, uh, real quick before I move on, uh, how what was the reception of the record like? I know you kind of said you were starting to be able to play with some of the bands and connect with some of the bands, but um, did you did you feel like people were hearing the record and 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 I assume people were digging it. I mean, honestly, I kind of feel like everybody listening to this podcast are like, is everyone that bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, I guess the, the reception was good, but you know, you're, you're in a little bit of a bubble to yeah. where, you know, seven ball and those, they're just going to write about a specific set of records. Yeah. What? And, you know, they're, if you have the touring cycle, you're just going to be in that touring cycle. This, and the bubble. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And it really only took that one year of touring that to kind of cure me for ever wanting to go back into that realm. No, and I've it. had a few conversations with people over the years that were like, maybe Pedro the Lion, but I think we're one of the few that started in the CCM realm that pieced out that didn't really have that legacy follow us around for yeah. our career and be a part of the narrative of like who you are yeah. and I part of that reason was that we just didn't really proliferate at all in that 
market. We weren't there to proselytize or, you know, we weren't preaching. We weren't yeah. playing that role. And I only went to one GMA conference thing and it, you know, gave me chills down to my spine for what mm-hmm. I heard. It was like, yeah. I, this isn't for me, man. And I get it that year touring saw so much stuff that I was like, if I'm going to go through this, you know, I can't have this intertwined with, with anything other than just what it is, which is just a machine of finance. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I hear that quite often with a lot of other uh, people I have on this podcast. It's, uh, it's a slippery slope, you know, always it's, you know, you want to be successful. You want to be able to have a fan base, but you know, at what expense or or where? You know, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself as well. You know, you want to be able to, you know, play with whoever and it be respected on the, on the music. You know, and you for know. sure. And that's where that's where we were coming from. And I think the decision to even sign with Cadence was based off of the fact that they were a sister to a Wea. They were distributed through Warner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Panic. So our records were in tower and getting away from just being able to be found in the Baptist bookstores and that yeah. sort of makes um, a lot of sense. That was kind of the driving factor of why, why I think we chose that. I got you. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I know as cliche as it sounds, things happen for a reason. And, you know, it's, you know, the label obviously went defunct. So yeah. is that kind of what led you to asthmatic kitty? Is that kind of what the next step was or, Kind of like it was very organic from that point forward. Literally, the the follow up thing we did to Hooray for Now it was the Weightless EP, which was done on a digital eight track in our apartment. So we literally right back to what we were doing before, recording on our own, you know, in our apartment and just going DIY. And honestly, Hooray for Now is the only album I've ever done that I didn't produce. So. It's, you know, it's tricky to ask somebody else to crawl into your head and yeah, vision, but um, did the weightless EP and at that time really started experimenting from like 2000 to like 2002 with just any and everything. Did the side project uh, Francis and got to open for Fugazi in 2001. Wow. I started this electric ill and getting people to rap on my answering machine and then chop that up. And I was started working with Chris Schlarb, who is now big ego studios at the time he had a label called sounds are active and just started getting like a little more prolific. Um, hang on a sec. Sorry. Um, You're good. Are, we, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, and during those years of just sort of like, you know, finding our creative footing, there was so much music coming out that was influential to me as a producer and kind of expanding my ideas of what home recording could be and could sound like, Um, you know, during that time frame, Air's 10,000 Hertz Legend came out. Radiohead came out, mm-hmm. Cannibal Ox and the Def Jux catalog came out, and that Cannibal Ox record is how I started my mastering relationship with Emily Lazar. Mm. Who she wound up mastering practically everything I've done since then. That's so cool. Uh, yeah, and so during those that 2001 to 2003 window, um, did a split. EP with Soul Junk. Oh yeah, great man. For for Cloud, uh, for Velvet Blue. Velvet, Velvet Blue, that's right. And uh, really met and hit it off with Michael Kaufman, who was in Soul Junk at the time. And we were literally like birds of a feather. Really loved that guy. Uh, creatively, would just geek on everything. Um, and he was doing A and R for Asthmatic Kitty at the time. And that's how I wound up meeting Lowell through him. Um, you know, I didn't even really meet Sufjan until later. And then when I lived in New York City, would run into him from time to time. But it was really Michael through Lowell was my connection to Asthmatic Kitty. 
And it was just an organic thing. It wasn't really like there was, um, you know, this courtship or anything. I, over the span of probably a year, a year and a half of just chipping away at different songs, Lovers Lead the Way is a real, like, it's all over the place. It looks Stop. great record. Great record. <laughs> Thanks. Again, not we didn't tell ourselves no for any style, and um, and uh, he just was like, we should we should work on it together. Let us let us put it out, and so that's how that happened. Um, and then Sufjan hit really big. Yeah. After that, um, the he came out with the whole Michigan and state yeah. and. Um, I wound up seeing him at Dante's a few years, like into the realm of it. And it was pretty cool to be backstage and meet like, you know, Annie who's St. Vincent now was doing yeah, back and just all these people just going different so places. Cool. But what wound up happening was that, you know, there was a shadow that was starting to get cast that I wanted to get a, un, out from underneath. So we did that record with asthmatic kitty and then kind of, moved on from that because it was like it's like saddle creek you know everything that comes out on saddle creek will start out with connor oberst's name in it and i could see with asthmatic kitty everything that came out on asthmatic kitty started out with sufjan yeah. yeah yeah so um it was great uh i'm proud of that album and loved it and started moved from Nashville to Portland during that time, finished recording in Nashville and then moved to Portland, Oregon. Um, and it came out while we were in Portland, Oregon, and we slowly started to become like, a, like a local band there that yeah. wa wasn't happening in Nashville. Yeah, I get that. We were being able to open for some bigger names and some artists that you respect, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I don't know how to put this. There, there's just a difference of how um, culturally people in the South look at homegrown things versus chain stuff mm -hmm. versus the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast looks at chain stores versus homemade stuff. Um, and they're polar opposites, you know. Um, we were doing the exact same thing in Nashville that we did in Portland. It just took off in Portland and it did yeah. not. Nashville. I, I get that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the lovers lead the way real quick. I know you just kind of mentioned that, uh, do you remember any specifics about recording that record with, um, any, anything that you can look back on and be like, that was a cool moment or anything of that nature? Um, you know, every single song was some sort of lesson learned. I, I listened to that album and I'm like, the reason why it sounds good, if at all, is because of Emily Lazar's mastering. <laughs> because the mixes I sent her were woo, all over yeah. the place. You know, I would, I would discover, oh man, this song has distorted drums. And so I would literally just write a song around the idea of blowing drums out or would discover a certain looping function and write a song around it and not really fully even understanding, you know, compression or EQs or any, you know, I was literally discovering mic placement and the cheap amps that I bought and like, why does it sound bad? Well, the yeah. speakers are out of phase. Like, what does that even mean? That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in, in that, in those moments of naive, creative recklessness, you, you can stumble upon some things that you wind up chasing later in life. Yeah. You know? And uh, I'm manufacturing that now, but it was happening genuinely at that time. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it just, it, it happened, you know, we were both working day jobs. And so I had a job where I was just sitting in front of a computer most of the time. And so I would load Cubase onto the work computer. So when I had downtime, I would just figure out how it worked and then come home and record stuff and just go from there. Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. It sounds like 
um, you know, between the first two records, it's like growing pains or not so much growing pains, but things that you can look back and be like, oh, okay, I remember that. And, you know, it probably set you up for the future and what you're doing now. So that's really cool totally. that you can always see the process, you know, when you look back, you're like, oh, okay, that's why that happened or what, you know, something of that nature. That was the first, okay, Lovers Lead the Way was the first computer-based uh, record I ever made in a oh, nice. window from, and it started my love affair with Steinberg. Um, before that, it was all just hard equipment, like, you know, four track, eight track, all just digital standalone equipment. But lovers lead the way was the first time, you know, with plugins and a DAW interface. And mm. that's so, um, it was cool. I was already pushing the limitations of that early on and figuring out, oh, wow, if this just had freeze functions, you know, the sky would be the limit. Then then I wouldn't be worried about using this one cool thing and it crashing my computer. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was an, it, every every single record is some sort of educational milestone. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's yeah, absolutely. It sounds like. That's the norm with a lot of people I talk to. It's and it's cool because the progression of maturity and the progression of learning and all that stuff. It's just cool that yeah. you're, it's all these like tools in your tool belt, you know, over the years. So, percent like that. That record when I listen to it now is very much everything in the kitchen sink, and it's that's what it is. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's fantastic. I was listening to it actually before I got on with you because I was just. Was one of those I was like I just picked one because I knew we were gonna talk today and I was like man this is such a banger record I, <laughs> it's so good like oh. there were fun little things of like oh this this one like thirty second thing it's great but it's not a song it's like okay cool then how about you just stop it and it's an intro to something completely different <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how it worked you know yeah well that's cool that's a that's a neat story need some neat stories about that that's awesome. Um, so you said you were kind of wanting to get out of the asthmatic kitty umbrella, if you will. Uh, I know the, the next record, the heat can melt your brain. Was that still on asthmatic as well? Or was that? No, we were in Portland at the time and, uh, and worked with a label out of Chicago called Minty Fresh. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, they had done Veruca Salt, which seemed like they might understand who we were a little <laughs> bit. But also the history of Viva Voce is, is just as much of putting out as, as good a records as we possibly could at the time was trying to find the right partner, you know? Yeah. To put that out and to give it like a fighting chance. Um, but things started to kind of click uh during um that album uh the heat can melt your brain and that was the last record that had residual songs in it mm -hmm. like a lot of bands have like that first second or third album that are like kind of songs from the previous one that got polished up to put on the new one mm -hmm. the heat can melt your brain was the last one that had songs from different time periods uh hooray for now and lovers lead the way they okay. were on that um i think the last song on uh the heat came out your brain was on the split that we did with soul junk there's a song called high highs that i had written during the lovers lead the way period on a program called acid mm -hmm. the, um, sonic foundry put out um so it was still a little bit more of that kitchen sink flair with um, that Lovers Lead the Way had, but we were automatically seeing, uh, like, let's do ourselves a favor in the live production realm and start to think about how we can do this live. Because at the time, it was just the two of us as a two-piece, you know, splitting signals out and having samples and that sort of thing live. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it became a chore when you make a record that has like 20 Mellotrons yep. and all the stuff to like, you know, how, how are we going to pull it gonna, off live? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
but that record was again uh, a very much homemade. I remember there were amps in the stove at certain points to get tones and just got a one of those giant 12 foot card tables and stuck it in the living room and you know recording equipment overtook life at every given point the house just looked like a cables running everywhere you know um and i had started writing for tape op magazine when we were living in nashville uh, mainly so I could meet Roger Mutino and pick his brain about recording Electro Pura by Yola Tango. Awesome. That's yeah, cool. and so when I moved to Portland, I hit up Larry Crane from Tape Op and, and Jackpot, and uh, we became buddies. And funny enough, the first time he invited me to the studio to say hey to him, Elliot Smith was in there too. Whoa. Was, yeah, it was pretty cool. Um but uh, Larry came and helped uh, kind of put the finishing touches of mixing on that record because that, that record was me figuring out like, oh, I really have no idea how to differentiate low end. You know, this is all a big muddy mess. Mm. Um, and just to have him open my eyes to stuff like what if you – you know, reverb on bass. What? No, you can't do that. You know, <laughs> um, and and just like you know, he's he's and still is a, a an incredible resource. But he graciously came in and and helped bumper lane me into uh, that album being what it is. And um, again, Emily mastering. You know, kind of put that. Whew. She's the only one. Honestly, after all these years, she's the only mastering engineer that I've worked with that I could tell a difference. Mm. Um, not that the other ones were bad. It's just that there's like a difference of like, oh, my gosh, this is yeah. even the same record. That's which, cool. um, but I remember, you know, Lovers Lead the Way and, and The Heat Came Out Your Brain were us kind of getting back to all the the four-track beginnings. Uh, you know, Hooray For Now, they sat me down and they were like, you know, I know you sang on half this record, but you're not going to sing on this album at all. I was mm -hmm. like, because we can't market you. We can market her, we can't market you. And mm. So when we left that dynamic, we went back to what we were doing before, where I got a chance to sing and harmonize and have a voice and a place, you know? Yeah. Uh, that was like listening back. I think that's probably one of my favorite ones is the heat came out of your brain. It felt, right. yeah, thanks. It, it felt, it felt very punk and genuine and, and refined at the same time. Like I came up with the riff to the first song alive with pleasure while I was standing in line at the post office, you know, I've got to wait in line all by myself. And I just sat there thinking this thing <laughs> came out. <laughs> That's so cool, dude. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say uh, about to go back about uh, hooray how they were saying we can't mark you i think it's funny because that's the first uh, iteration i heard of you guys and so that's kind of how i always thought you sounded and then when i wound up hearing the other records i love that you're a part of it like i th i think that like that is the sound to me now you know like cool. above all the records it's like you guys as a tandem vocally just had your it just fit <laughs> you know it it, it seemed it that's the way it started you know and and it, of us just sitting down at the four track and I would have a song, she would have a song. And sometimes we'd pass it back and forth, verse, bridge, and harmonize it a certain part. And I, I don't really think until probably the last record, we kind of got the formula right of, yeah. of mixing things. But um, yeah, it was nice. It was nice to have a voice. That's there. cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So after that record, um, obviously you're playing shows throughout these last two records. Uh, any tour? As, was there extensive touring with that, or was it? Oh, I know you mentioned it was yeah. hard to kind of do that, but it, insane. No, I mean once we figured it out, I, I always love a technical challenge, and once we figured it out, um, it was game on. And we'd gotten a booking agent in Chicago, Derek Becker, who 
is an awesome human being, was running satellite booking. And we fired it up and would get us, you know, opening dates and then we would get our own. Um, a lot of the time, you know, we, we were managing ourselves. So, and, you know, it was just the two of us would, you know, so it was just one income stream. So it was like survival as well. Yeah. So there was a lot of business mixed with creative uh, always. And so, you know, that record was when we uh, got licensed overseas for the first time wow. and got a publishing contract for the first time and went from, you know, pension pennies to put gas in the tank to getting a, a publishing advance and like, well, thanks for the check, you know, <laughs> but and then slowly, you know, over time they recouped and we, we, we did okay. We did okay. Publishing wise, you know, right. almost record from that point forward that we put, put out, got really decent licensing and syncs. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that album, we did a ridiculous amount of touring to support and overseas, uh, UK did the UK for the first time, uh, did Europe for the first time, which was, you know, a trip. Um, we had our first d bout with getting all of our, not all of it, but the more important pieces of gear stolen oh while we were my. in London one time. And I never forget, we had a tour starting the next day and the label gave us enough to just scrape by and and make it happen but we had like an hour or something on in in london there's this place called denmark street that's all the music stores mm. and we just split the money anita had half and i had half i was like you take that side i'll get this side and when we get to the end of the street whatever we have is what we're starting this tour with <laughs> so <laughs> You know, I had figured out all the cabling that I needed. I, I figured at that point I could just download MP3s and split mono, stereo, left, right. You know, yeah. the click would come to me. The rest would go to front of house and part everything down. And it was a heady lesson of, like, don't ever tour with something that you're going to grieve, you know. Yeah. 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 But uh, an amazing experiences, you know, Stonehenge. Um Europe, the food, the culture, all of it. Um, yeah, it's awesome. so cool. yeah it's great. That's awesome. So next up, is that kind of when Barsuk came in the in the picture? Uh, or is that um... uh, get your blood sucked out? Yeah, that was Barsuk. Yeah, I mean, how did Barsuk? I mean, Josh. Uh, who runs Barsuk? We we played a lot in Seattle. Uh, Vera Project. There were so many Seattle homies and, and bands that we would play with, like Aqueduct and tours with them. That you just kind of run into these people, you know. And I think Josh and and even at the time Ben from Death Cab. I didn't even know who he was. He was just the boyfriend of this girl Joan that would come to shows. And it was like her boyfriend Ben. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't know who he was at the time. These were just people that would come to shows. And yeah. Josh was like, hey, uh, you know, we'd love to put out this record. Um, so that it was just really organic. You know, there was – I don't think there's ever been a period uh, where um, I ever, like, actively solicited a record label. That's cool. It, what an yeah. awesome! What I mean, that's what you what you would want. They they come kind of come to you, you know. Well, it was very organic, and I think that you know maybe it's not always the best business practice to do that, but sure. very much like you know, it, it felt natural and it didn't feel like a forced you know endeavor. Um, sure. But they it, that was also the transition of the industry going through like we're blazing through all this stuff, but like in the time frame of like 2001 to 2006, a lot of wild stuff happened in the music industry yeah. and the death of the compact disc and, you know, moving into the streaming platform and that kind of thing. 
was starting to happen. So the holes were starting to get wider and wider and wider. Um, and, you know, Get Your Blood Sucked Out was the first album where it was all fresh, like with a guitar, new songs, you know. I love that record. I love that record. Thanks, man. Uh, I think for it's it's probably one of the best like selling ones that we've done, the best received ones. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with Believer. The first track was you. You thanks, man. It was used for some like of those uh, some vampire shows that were on. <laughs> I, I can't. That's say, awesome. My brain is shut down. <laughs> But like the OC or something like that, yeah. you know, it got picked up. A, a couple of little trendy, cool things started playing it, so it got on the radar. And that album, uh, as that was happening, uh, James and the Shins were um, wrapping up recording "Wincing the Night Away." Wow! They got a copy of it. And they were looking for female harmonies and stuff like that. So we went up to Supernatural and Anita cut, uh, um, Anita did all the uh, harm, female harmonies on that record. And I, I may have done some percussion here or there, but <laughs> it was mainly just a trip to see how that process happened. And unsurprisingly, the songs that she sang on became like the hits off that album. So when they went out on tour, they grafted us in as the opening band. And then once we were done, you know, she would sing with them. And on occasion, I would get to do the cowbell or tambourine or whatever. So we were just kind of like the baby band, a part of the entire Wincing the Night Away campaign. Wow. So that Get Your Blood Sucked Out, literally 2006 and 2007, was just bus chasing the shins while their rocket just ascended, you know. Unbelievable. We just sat and watched this these guys became, you know, world famous during that process. So Wow. What were those shows like? Were they just bonkers? It was yeah, it was it was pretty insane. Um it, you know, from my vantage point, it was just the logistics of the two of us loading in, loading out and chasing a bus on these insane drives and that kind mm. of thing. They booked the front end of that tour in winter in a very off time so that, you know, on paper you you'd sell it out because you're not really competing with anyone. Yeah. But for for where we were at, the stress of having to like drive through, you know, a blizzard <laughs> for twelve hours to make it just in enough time to like sound check was was a, a lot. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. a lot. So I remember being a bundle of nerves for the bulk of it, just just in actually pulling it off. But it couldn't have been a cooler situation and hang, you know. It went from, you know, your typical green room to like very quickly they would just have all the spread and food and yeah. There would there would be like Paul Frank would bring a trailer full of clothes for them and like gifts and stuff like that. And um and then the late night TV show stuff started happening and you know I got to be ringside with the band wives while they played an SNL and Unbelievable. Jake Jake Gyllenhaal was the host. So I got, everyone was mortified that it was him. No one was speak to him because they were just completely starstruck. So it was just basically me hanging out with Jake Gyllenhaal. That's so cool. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. That rules, Um, dude. What a cool experience. Like It was extremely, extremely cool experience. Um, You know, and more, more touring overseas, you know, and, and our relationship with our uh, label over there, full time hobby, was increasing, and we had PIOS in France and in Europe. So it felt like things were working. You yeah. know, yeah. it was it was good. But what wound up happening is that there's this thing that's like once you're open for bands of that caliber, and we've since opened for, I mean, tons of bands like. Uh, Jimmy World and and Sunny Day Real Estate, even on the How how It Feels tour. Yeah. But, you know, there's that 
moment where you know you you need to go from the opener to the headline thing yeah yeah and instead we wound up being the band that got a lot of publishing and licensing and stuff wow. yeah but yeah i was gonna ask you what what was the reception like on those tours i mean i feel like personally if i would have seen went to go see those bands i would have been like hell yes this is incredible like this is like totally you know the reception was great, you know, uh, good, but I think that the anticipation for the Shens was so palpable that they, they literally could have gotten anyone to open for them. I got you. I get and it. And at the time on those bands feel like opening those opening slots are, are you know, the, the brass ring, but most of the time you're just playing to people getting a beer or buying a T-shirt or like making their way in, you know. Yeah, yeah. You're, you are the sound guy ringing the room out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I guess that could, I guess things could be worse. You can still be playing a small little club that no one's at. But at least, yeah, I get it. I, you know, you it's know, funny. I know I get it because I like. Yeah. I'm the type of person I like to go to shows early because I, I usually discover good bands, you know, totally. for the most part. But the older I get, I definitely am like. Uh, let's stay here at the bar and get a couple more beers and we'll mosey on in. You know. <laughs> Although I will say this, I had an experience recently that completely like floored me. I went to go see Pinback in Oh, I love them. With Portland, uh, a friend of mine surprised me with tickets and walked in and the opening band literally stole the show. Like so my, cool. throat, my mouth was on the floor. I was just called Disheveled Cuss, this guy named Nick Reinhardt and one like sweetest dude like just almost like you know every single song i was getting mad i'm like he he did it before i had a chance <laughs> like it was so good that's so cool yeah that's sweet i have to check them out or him out i guess i should yeah. say sweet so next record uh <laughs> rose city man I, I, real quick yeah get your blood sucked out i know i said it's amazing but it is Bangers after bangers after bangers, and I just um, I, I appreciate saying that you you had mentioned Believer being one of your favorites on there. Yeah, dude, it's so good. The funny thing is, is that I vividly remember the control room where we had put the speakers and the table full of recording equipment was in the back part of the house, and we had listened back to all the mixes that we had at that point that we had chosen for the album. And it felt like there was one missing and I grabbed a guitar and I just started strumming a D and I remember just literally writing that I'm a believer now from the living room to the back room. And when I got there, just started recording it. That's so cool. It, yeah, it was just it was almost like, hey, there's something missing. Let's just keep. And then honestly, like that happened a couple of times with Viva Diamond Mind off of uh, The Future Will Destroy You was yeah. written. Just because we didn't like whatever song was there and just 86 it and was like, well, what song should go here, you know? But that Believer was just like, yeah, we don't have it yet. Like, so here it is. <laughs> That's so cool. And it just wound up being your biggest song on that. That's so cool. Yeah, That's probably. Amazing. God. That's sick. Yeah. All right, Rose City. That record, let's talk about that a little bit. You're still obviously on Barsuka on that record. We, we, we are. And... um so in between Get Your Blood Sucked Out and um, Rose City, we went from two-piece to starting to realize that there was like uh, only a finite amount of ability to keep that going, yeah. physically just destroying me. Um, so um, in between... Get Your Blood Sucked Out in Rose City started the genesis of what became Blue Giant. Okay, cool. And honestly knew that we, like, if you turn a record in, there's advances from the publishing and from the record label that you use mostly to live on and to facilitate, you know, the recording process or whatever. In a perfect world, you would just use all that money to make a banging record, but that's not really how it works. Sure, sure. Um, so we knew that if we turned a Viva Voce record in, we would get advance money. And that's practically why Rose City exists. I see. Um, it was just 
to fulfill an obligation and to facilitate um, Blue Giant, essentially. There's no symbols on Rose City, not a hi-hat, not a crash, not a ride. Um, I was becoming completely obsessed with like uh, modern English and oh, yeah. um, a producer's name who escapes me right now that recorded a lot of the Joy Division stuff and just how we would isolate everything. Um, mm -hmm. I played bass and just became obsessed with like bass tones and chorus and how to make the most out of rhythm sections and things like that. So Rose City feels like an exercise of production techniques That's cool. and song delivery. Um, that, and there's some, some of my favorite songwriting moments are actually in that record. Mm -hmm. um, but even from the artwork down, every other record was very meticulous and hand done. And this was like a photograph, you know, very stark, very minimal. Um, at that point, we realized print media was dying, and so we asked if we could use the uh, budget for that for like park benches and buses and other other avenues. Um, but the Portland Timbers wound up using Rose City as a cheer for their. That's so cool. Yeah, so I got I have a recording somewhere on my computer of a soccer stadium singing the chorus to Rose City. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's um, so cool. But that touring process was brief. I, we did, I think, one or two, <laughs> brief, one or two U.S. tours was brief for us. Like, <laughs> we toured constantly um, and had Karina Rep and Evan Railton join us on that. Evan wound up playing. Uh, Evan, we first met when he was playing in a band called Pep Squad. Oh, I, I've seen them a couple times back in the day, way back in the day. He played in uh, Swords Project and a bunch of different bands. We'd known each other over the years. And Karina is an amazing musician and guitar player in Portland. And just had them in so that I could play bass and kind of sing and not ruin my rotator cuff any more than I had done. Um, and, yeah, and we toured toured Rose City essentially to get to the places like South by Southwest and that sort of thing to be able to play Blue Giant stuff for people, showcase it and show that like, we, at that point we were kind of interested in diversifying and starting to do other things. I gotcha. Well, yeah. you mentioned Blue Giant. Let's talk about that record. I, I know, cause I know you want to put another Viva record out, but Blue Giant, I absolutely love that record as well. I, you know, Thanks. I went on a deep dive and Thanks. I just love how, different it is and how i love the way it sounds i just think a little like the things about it it's like just uh and uh, kind of just talk about how that kind of happened um that's sure like a, a cool story sure uh you know there is like a very much a love of uh ray davies and the kinks and davies and um just the sonic exploration of like you know anita more so than i grew up bluegrass and country um and uh you know there was n never really a place in the viva paradigm to fit these things so um we just i remember sat with evan railton and picked names out of a hat and you know blue giant is a certain kind of star or a planet or something and it felt like one of those 70s like area code 615 or something like <laughs> some random psychedelic country band because the aim was to put in that velvet underground recklessness in with the songwriting craftsmanship of the yeah. kicks with like just enough burrito brothers to make it somewhat country lap steel and mandolin but really skew it a little more rock and roll yeah um, the Americana thing hadn't really, you know, become what it is now. So bizarrely, there were, you know, pioneers of the Pacific Northwest music scene that weren't doing much at that time. And we lived across the street from Corin Tucker, who sang for sings for Sleater Kenny. Wow and had met Sam from Quasi 
and they weren't doing anything at that time. They weren't playing. And I remember asking Corin if she wanted to sing a duet with me. And she was like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, you know. And That's so cool. So I got to sing a country duet with Corin Tucker. That's amazing. Yeah. And then Sam, um, we, we did a tour of Portland and, and basically like make a wish – foundation for musicians like we will back you up whatever you want to play whatever you want to play we'll back you up um just like a little carrot on the stick to be able to play music with these people and sam came with some incredibly bizarre and cool song choices and so we would blue giant did a tour of portland like for a week we would play like an all ages show and then a club show and then a different club show and We'd have Corin play, and then Sam would be our guest, and then Karina would be our guest, and we'd different, you know, uh, always trying to kind of do something in the community a little different. Yeah. yeah. And um, through that dynamic, wound up meeting Stephen, who was running Vanguard Records at the time. And that's kind of how viva eventually wound up working with them yeah i was gonna ask you about that That's... yeah so it was like chris funk from the decemberists uh wound up doing a lot of we had worked together on red fangs murder the mountain oh wow uh, yeah i recorded the vocals and the guitars for that whole record um which was a trip and chris produced it so we worked together for that recording process and Chris is an awesome dude. And I think the Decembers were taking a hiatus and he um, he played a bunch on the Blue Giant stuff and through him was like, hey, you should check out this band I'm playing with with Steven. It, again, you know, didn't pursue them. It was just like an organic thing. Um, and I think that the EP, the first EP we did was with Jealous Butcher and ourselves and they picked up the full length, which was after Rose City. Yeah. How how did you feel about, about that record? I mean, you know, you've done Viva Voce pretty much your whole career, and then now you're kind of working with other people, number one, and being able to write with other people. And kind of how, how was that? I love that it. record. Now? I, I mean, I, I, it was fantastic. It was a little bit like... Um, the reckless earlier days of just go for it, you know, there was no real bullseye other than just writing a great song and trying to push the boundaries. Uh, but um, my memories of that are, are good. The shows were um, always an ordeal, like always I'd try to make it, you know, uh, whether you, I, I just love you, love us or hate us, just don't be indifferent. You know, yeah. I would, yeah. just, and, that, and that was the goal. Like yeah, there was live, it was very velvet underground reckless, but we had, you know, pedal steel. So the, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Um, did, so Touring wise, what did you do? Was it just basically around the the Northwest, or did you to do a full U.S. tour? Or? With with Rose City or or Blue well, Giant? actually either one. Okay, well, so they they like kind of segue two thousand nine into two thousand ten. Like, had Karina and Evan, and knew that we needed people around us to make this thing happen. Um, and you know, I think toured Rose City briefer than we toured blue giant um but at that time blue giant started being booked by kevin french who booked bobby bear jr and at that time there was a documentary being made about his life mm. and we got booked to be the opening tour band on that tour and back him up wow which was bonkers. And so there was, there's a documentary about his life that we're in. That's for so the, cool. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we toured Blue Giant enough to where we realized why we were in a two piece to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we, I have a vivid memory of being, you know, the last Blue Giant show we were playing with the Dandy Warhols. 
Wow. And yeah, we got to do some shows with them and it was super great. They're a fantastic band live and we were up in the balcony and I remember Anita and I were like, we need to do a Viva Voce record back to just the two of us because yeah. at that point it had been since like 2006 or seven or yeah. six rather, you know, and um, literally went home and started immediately um, the future will destroy you. Like, and, and so Vanguard, were they kind of in the loop about this? Were you like, hey, I want to put another Viva? Were they on board right away or was it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we told them, told them immediately what, what we were going to do. And Steve was like, well, you know, we, we, we would be interested in that. Um, if, you know, and so it was almost like we've got an outlet for it automatically. Um, Barsuk, we were, we had closed that chapter and they were restructuring things, how they, you know, were working with bands. Sure. It was a peaceful parting there. And so it felt very organic to work with them. And um, that record process was the quickest of all of them. Uh, like, I think 12, maybe 13 days all in, like less than two weeks. <laughs> was that because of money or was that because you just had all the songs and you were ready to go? No, it was purely... Uh, purely necessity being the mother of invention because like there was you know the the cycle of advances and this, you don't get anything until you turn something in so it's like turn it have to turn something in that outdoes it previous yeah and you have to do it in, in two weeks <laughs> yeah well that makes sense i mean I, again great record love it so good you know hey. I, I feel like the the thing with you guys is every record Sounds like you, but it doesn't sound like you, or or it sounds different. And I I think that's one of the coolest things about Viva Voce in general is like this is Viva Voce, but this is Viva Voce in a different light or in a different viewpoint. For sure, I, I would agree with that. And I think that the circumstances always factor into the sound and and what what you're writing about like the way things sound all of it is is all of the factors that have nothing to do with the music itself you yeah. know um and i think creatively artistically i'm most proud of the production work on that album and wow. of the future will destroy you That's it's great. the one that holds up the most for me over time and uh you know, I had that same computer that I built that I did Lovers Lead the Way on. I did all those records on every wow. single, yeah, all the way up to the last one was The Future Will Destroy You. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned you're most proud about pr the production on that. What are you most proud of, um, maybe song wise, or, or maybe the, your f favorite songs that you've written um, overall? Like, what, 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 if you, Look back, are you like, this is something that I'm hold fondly to my heart? Something like that. Um, I mean, of the whole catalog? Well, let's do Viva right now, because I was going to ask you about your solo stuff here in a yeah. few minutes anyway. So, uh, You know, favorites, I think there, there's like ones like The Wandering Soul off of, of – um, The Future Will Destroy You and High Highs off of uh, – the heat can melt your brain. You know, there there are ones that have special significance lyrically that musically don't have the same wow moments of like, you know, there was a lot of just uh, blind discoveries in the moment that happened on every record, but really on The Future Will Destroy You was when I had at least cut my teeth enough on the previous records that hopefully had learned something from all that. Sure. That I felt like I was operating at my top form at that point, at least on a PC that I'd built in 2002. <laughs> <laughs> all faithful. <laughs> yeah, and all with unbalanced inputs and outputs and like a RCA 8 input sound card. It was just like a relic, you know. I've never upgraded from... Cubase 3. Um, so, you know, it never touched the internet. It was just like a, 
even by the standards from 2011, it was old school, you know. Wow. But um, had felt like I'd really reached the 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 ceiling of what I could do with the stuff that I had, and figured out how to make the sounds that I wanted, and that was a a cool experience to be able to know like when you do have a sound in your head, exactly how to achieve that. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the first times that I was able to do that. <laughs> That's so cool. That's yeah. really, really cool. Um, let's talk about the electric L real quick. I know you mentioned that earlier. I, I, it's so different from everything else and it's, it's still so cool. Let, let's talk about that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I've resurrected it at different points. Um, it started out, uh, the electric illumination and just electric ill and started out just with this program acid and just chopping things up and getting friends who would rap to leave answering machine messages with raps. So I would come home at the end of the night and there would be like 30 minutes of just madness on my answering machines from <laughs> That's so cool. the country. <laughs> And I would just load it into this program and chop them up and just make the weirdest hip hop I could. Um, I had a turntable that I didn't know how to scratch. So I would just hold it like a pizza box and just sort of wiggle it under my hand uh, like I was rocking a baby or something. And would just find little moments where it sounded bearable and float that in there. Um cool. Yeah, I just, again, it was just one of those moments where, like, if I had an idea to do something and it didn't fit in a paradigm of View of OJ or whatever, I would just make something up. Cool. And Francis was one of those. Electric Ill is one of those. Um, and then later in 2013, um, made an EP with a friend of mine uh, and had fun with it. It was like electro. I just sang through a vocoder and, you know, just made weird dance stuff. That's cool. That's yeah. awesome. What was that called? Oh, the electric ill. The oh, sorry. I thought you were saying something different. I apologize. Uh, twisted light. Oh, you twisted can't... light. All right. You mentioned that. Okay. I remember you saying that. There's, there's only like, I think a few releases by electric ill. There's a split EP that's on sounds are active. That's, me rapping and this pitch shifted madness um, that all the phone machines um, and I can't remember what that split EP is even Vlahemia or something. Uh, yeah, wonder why people can't find it. <laughs> and, and Twisted Light EP came out in 2013. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, your solo stuff. Love the KLR record. I've been Thanks. jamming that lately. Um, I know when you like. Discovered it when you and I started talking. I was like, whoa, this is so cool. Love it. Let's talk about that record a little bit. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, I moved back here in 2018, back to Muscle Shoals, after having run the gauntlet in New York City, composing music there full time for a production company. And, you know, I'd spent the bulk of my life creating in collaboration with other people but had never just done for myself what I had done for others, you know, yeah. as like a pure act of self-love. I wanted to take songs that I had written and loved and finalize them and do for myself what I had done for other people and for companies. And um, that's how that record began. Um, and since I'm here in Muscle Shoals, I had the opportunity of like, you know, having David Hood, who's a swamper and, you know, Rolling Stones, number eight best bass player in the world. Unbelievable. Play on play on it. And, you know, Will McFarland, who brought his son to play to, to watch Nine Volt Velvet play. I had Will play guitar and his son play guitar on it. Um, just kind of a real a heart release for me. Yeah. And like not, you know, I'd spent a good couple of years in New York making, uh, composing for, you know, TV primarily. So it was like everything's truncated, 30 seconds, you cramming all this stuff in and I'll, you know, let the belt out a little bit, let a song, like let, let it loop 
eight times. Who cares? Like, let yeah. the let the vibe. Let this. If it's six minutes, who cares? Like, just yeah. let, it, let it be. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was uh, put it out during the pandemic. It just and I I love it. It's yeah. It's who I was then, and it's like I'm able to put that to bed and move on from there. Yeah. Um, That's but, cool, dude. Yeah, yeah. those songs that I'd accumulated, I'd written and accumulated from what, like 2007. So yeah. it was nice yeah. to kind of like put out this collection of songs that no one had heard. That's awesome. Dude, what's the future yeah. hold, man? Like, what's what's next, man? I, I mean, this is so extensive, and I'm so. <laughs> It's so, I feel bad because I know we've lost, probably lost or left a ton out, but it's like. It's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm always making music, always. And, um, you know, I, I have a baby daughter, and so I chase her around a lot. And I realized that the idea of, like, writing songs had changed for me because standard tuning, I think I was only getting standard results from. So I found this tuning partly by accident um, that has basically reconnected me to that feeling that I had with Nine Volt Velvet of like pure, you know, the four track days of like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but this is cool and I'm not going to question it, you know. Yeah. So with this new tuning, it's almost as if I can just flush everything I ever knew about the guitar down the commode and start all over again. And in February, I wrote and recorded a whole album's worth of new material in this style. So I've just sort of turned the page creatively uh, in that I'm embracing a new era of um writing in a style that is reconnecting me to that, um, you know, that naive, innocent period of like, really have no concept of where this is going other than it just sounds good to me. And That's thankfully, right. technology is caught up so fast that you can record something and have no clue what key you're in, no clue at all what mashed notes are even are. And now, Programs like Steinberg have this audio to chord MIDI functions to where it'll tell you what you're playing. Then not only that, let you decide, like, do you want to put this through a CMI Fairlight, you know? Wow. So really quickly chasing my kid around, you can write songs just by stabbing at the neck in random places and allowing yourself just that innocent creativity time again. Um, you know, I've, delved into the earlier days of the CCM, Mike Knott, Dead Artist Syndrome. Love and, it. And, 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 you know, like, and then chasing the why of like, why do, why do I like this? You know, well, is it the drum machine? Like, what did he use? Oh, it turns out it's a Roland R5. Well, maybe try exclusively writing with a Roland R5, you know? Yeah. That kind of thing, just reconnecting with my roots and like really honoring what it is I loved about that time frame and allowing myself now with all of these musical abilities I've accrued just kind of to be OK with going back to writing stuff that it doesn't necessarily have to fit into some mold of this yeah. sound, this, you know, you're yeah. you're forever chasing your the, the high water mark of you know this Radiohead album or like this whatever that these guys set the bar and you're like wow this is I want to sound like them like for the first time in my life I'm making music and I don't really have anyone I can compare it to and it feels good that's awesome that's so <laughs> cool man that's so profound like it really is like it's funny because I'm listening to you and you have all these incredible opportunities happen and, and be able to play these stuff. And it's like you, like anyone else just want the simpleness, the happiness and just, you know, mm -hmm. being simple or being, or writing a simple song or something, you know, it's like something that, you know, you've had to go through life experiences and it's brought you back to a point where you look back and you look fondly on things and, you know, mm -hmm. it's perspective, you know? So, yeah, you make, you make peace with yourself in ways that you probably wouldn't normally if you didn't do this kind of thing. Because 
as a songwriter and an artist, you're actively always looking at yourself in ways that most people do everything to avoid. Yeah. You know, you're doing, I mean, once you figure out the C, G, A minor, F part of writing a song, the rest of the work is you and people and like the, you know, the Carl Jung side, the Joseph Campbell side of what's inside there. And yeah. If you only have like one palette to choose from, it's going to get real monochromatic real, real quick. Um, so, you know, I've done digging, but also in the gear side, you know, I'm finishing an amp rebuild of a 1988 PV stereo chorus 400 that I back in my earlier days would have laughed at, you know, but <laughs> Now, in my elder years, I realize, you know, I've had a JC 120, a 77, and a 40 at various points in my life, and this crappy $200 PV amp outdoes all of them. So getting over myself to be like, okay, this is the jam of all jams, and I'm going to create things around it using, cool. um, yeah, it's so cool. it's been really creatively like honestly this last year since Ruby's been born has been the most creatively prolific I've ever been. That's so cool. That yeah. is amazing. Yeah. When's the do you have a timetable maybe when the new record's coming out or um, this summer's going to be bonkers. I was hoping that it was going to be summer, but I we'll wait and see. I'm now in the process of like listening to the demos endlessly and and coming up with the the vocal melodies and all yeah. that. You going to tour it at all? I mean, doubtful. <laughs> I'll probably <laughs> I'll probably do a few shows like here. And stuff. Honestly, like probably do more online stuff so that people yeah. can see it, you know, Be and part if, of it. Yeah. Yeah. The demand for it and it's realistically fits in my life, then cool. I just I don't really miss it to be yeah, honest. I don't I don't blame you. loading in the back door of some <laughs> club, like no, no, I'm yeah. good. I used to book shows and I loved it at the time. Now I'm like, 10 o'clock comes around, it's time to go home. I yeah. don't want to be here late. <laughs> I mean, I see so many buddies doing it. I'm just like, I can't believe I did no. this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Dude, we need to get Hooray for now on vinyl somehow. We have got to get. If 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 it if there's a demand for it, you know, then sure. I'd, I, I also have like this juxtaposition, this paradigm about product you know vinyl yeah. do we need do we need that <laughs> do i mean we, i would like that? to like throw it on and put it on instagram for a day no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no uh, dude, I, these well, phones we're holding in our hands like this right. is this is it and yeah but most people you know buy records maybe put them on once or twice i know all, all the petroleum and all the waste i just like you know years ago the no blood for oil stickers they're printed on petroleum based plastic That's and so funny. The oil that it takes to make records i'm like we, we can do better that's hilarious yeah man. kevin this has been so freaking cool i really really appreciate it um man, right, man. what an awesome opportunity and I'm, I'm so stoked to get to know you now it's really cool and i really like appreciate you spending time with me man likewise thanks for having me absolutely oh by the way uh, i would have voted for you so <laughs> I'm glad I didn't win. To be <laughs> awesome, man. I will talk to you soon. All right, Jeremy. Listener, thank you so much for tuning in. Kevin Robinson, thank you so much for giving me your time. Amazing conversation, awesome, awesome stories uh, from the legend himself. I'm really, really stoked on this. Um, thank you again uh, for tuning in, man. I really, uh, I couldn't do this without you guys listening, so thank you so much. Um, really stoked on the future. Uh, really stoked on who I've got coming up uh, at the Rumors Are True cast on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, thank you again, Kevin, for your uh, time and your stories, and I hope to hang soon. Uh, listener, it's been a journey. Let's keep it going.